uh, lecture is by uh, Justin Eken. Uh, so Justin, thanks for being with us and feel, uh, please feel free to share the screen when you're ready. Okay, great, thank you. You can hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Okay, thanks again for having me back. Um, today I wanna uh, switch gears a little bit and think uh, more specifically about the energetic dynamics of consumers on landscapes and um, think of some of these processes in maybe a little bit of a different way um, and then aim to leverage uh, these ideas to examine a really interesting transition in uh, the history of mammalian systems. Um, and this is effectively uh, the evolution of grasslands. And I know you've already had some great talks about the evolution of, or about grasslands and savanna systems, um, <clears throat> where we are grass specialists. Everything, almost everything we eat is grass. You know, beer is grass, juice, uh, bread is grass, rice is grass. Uh, we, we rely a, a lot on grasses. Um, and so the evolutionary transition when grasslands evolved as a, as a unique biome um, was a really significant, a si significant event in mammalian evolution. So, so that's one of the, that's where I'll end today. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's see. And really what I want to do is look at um, the dynamics of starvation and recovery and think of these processes from an allometric perspective. Uh, as a function of body size. And I wanna try to make the argument that uh, this time scale of these processes really structures a lot, um, some of the constraints uh, of mammals that terrestrial mammals experience. And so again, I'm kind of isolating my, my thought processes towards uh, mammals and more specifically terrestrial mammals. Uh, the rules change a little bit when, when you don't have to support your own weight, uh, like aquatic mammals do, don't have to. Um, so starting very simply, right, um, all organisms, as we all know, uh, must find food, acquire food, and process food. Uh, they have to get the energy required for reproduction to pass on their genes to the next generation. Um, and organisms do this in very different ways. Uh, some organisms consume a lower quality food that's more evenly distributed. Uh, some organisms uh, consume higher quality food that's somewhat more clumped over space. And other organisms uh, such as this hyena in the lower left uh, consume very, very energetic, energetically rich foods uh, that are very clumped in space uh, and, and also happen to move around space. Uh, and these are all unique challenges depending on the different uh, foraging strategy organisms are following. Uh, and they all function to uh, distribute risk. Um, so, so dealing with risk is part of the game. It's part of uh, being alive, right? Um, and uh, organisms evolve different strategies to cope with the risks that they experience. Um, when we think about just finding food, finding resources, uh, we can think about the availability of foods. Um, so organisms must, depending on the foods that they're trying to acquire, they must search for foods on a landscape. And whether that landscape has a lot of food or a little food, uh, really uh, has an impact on their strategy. That's in part due to the, the natural conditions of the landscape, the abiotic conditions. It's also due to the biotic conditions like competition. Uh, they have to deal with dispersion, how patchily distributed food is across the landscape. Um, sometimes encounter rates are, are very short and some, sometimes encounter rates are very long uh, or very large. Uh, they have to deal with energy densities, differing energy densities of foods. A lot of foods that are homogeneously distributed uh, tend to be poor nutritional quality. Uh, other foods that are more clumped in space uh, tend to be higher nutritional quality. You know, think on one end of, of a grazer consuming grass that's relatively poor nutritional quality compared to a carnivore on the other end of the spectrum who's searching for these large packets of food. Uh, <laughs> if we can think of herbivores as packets of food um, that are incredibly energy dense, but it takes a lot of effort and skill to, to, to find them and track them down and, and ultimately uh, acquire them. Um, in addition to these food related risks, organisms at the same time, of course, have to balance um, the, you know, the, the skill of not dying. So they have to avoid predation. 
Um, and that is going to change uh, across landscapes. It's going to uh, change across, it's going to influence the behavior of organisms. And I would say to first approximation, many of these uh, strategies to deal with risk um, is, it can be captured by body size. So body size really alters the risk landscape that organisms experience uh, within a system. And I'll get to, to that in more detail. I started talking about that a little bit during my last uh, uh, seminar. And we've seen this graph before. Um, body size is really important. It structures a lot of things in mammalian systems. Here, it's structuring the, 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 the mortality due to predation. So I'm not gonna go through this, uh, explaining this uh, too long, except to say that um, here we see uh, herbivores uh, at, uh, arrayed as a function of their mass on the x-axis and, and the y-axis is the percent mortality due to predation. And there's this sharp cutoff at 310 kilograms. If you're smaller than that, you, you are consumed. Um, if you're larger than that, you escape predation. So we know that body size influences interactions. And um, that is pretty obvious on ecological timescales. However, if we zoom out and think more across evolutionary timescales, I think what is also obvious is that interactions influence body size. And there's this uh, dynamic feedback over evolutionary time between the ecology of an organism as a function of its body size and the selective forces operating on that organism that's going to perhaps shift its body size over evolutionary time. So this is one of, this is another one of my favorite like science figures. <laughs> so this is um, in a paper by John Alroy in 1998. I'm looking in the uh, over here, so the upper the upper left, um, called Cope's Rule and the Dynamics of Body Mass Evolution in North American Fossil Animals, where uh, John Alroy compiled this enormous compendium of, of body sizes of different North American uh, animals over the last uh, 80 million years, um, as well as the, the dates of their occurrence, their best estimates of their occurrence dates. And so that's represented in that, in this upper left figure, um, each uh, clade is represented by a line that represents how long it was around. And, you know, back here, this is around 66 million years ago. This is the, when the asteroid hits, hits Earth and dinosaurs go extinct. Um, and we see before that point, and these are just, again, mammals. Uh, before that point, mammals were relatively small. Uh, this is a, a log scale, right? So this is body mass in grams. And after the asteroid impact, uh, dinosaurs are wiped out, at least non-avian dinosaurs are wiped out, and mammals fill the space. And there's actually been some really nice uh, diffusion models applied towards understanding how mammalian body size fills this empty space that, that the asteroid uh, leaves. So they fill this niche space and uh, very quickly attain very large body sizes. Um, you'll also notice there's more structure in this too. There's kind of a gap here uh, that begins to form around 40, uh, 35 million years ago or so. Uh, which I'm not really going to touch on today, but there's a lot of interesting structure in the evolution of body size over time. And we call this Cope's rule, the evolution of larger body size uh, within clades over evolutionary time. And this is observed in terrestrial systems. It's also observed uh, not just for mammals, but across, across uh, different clades. It's, it's, it's observed in uh, marine realms as, all, as well. Uh, so Cope's rule seems to be a very uh, common and large scale macro evolutionary phenomenon. Now, another thing that John Alroy did, which was uh, really interesting, is he documented, um, he took this data and looked at the change in mass um, over a given period of time relative to the mass of the older species. So he created this um, kind of a stability uh, diagram, right? Where, where uh, if, if the trend is in, on this side of the graph, and I've kind of rotated it um, just so the masses line up uh, on the y-axis of both figures, which is kind of a funny way of looking at it. But if the trend is on this side, that means there, there's growth towards larger body size. And if the trend is on the, the negative side, that means there's decline in body size uh, within that temporal window of the clade. And what he found is, well, it looks like there's an evolutionary attractor in body size at, at, at a lower size, but there's also an attractor um, at, at a larger size. And this would uh, describe um, very well this idea of Cope's rule, where there's this slow uh, tracking towards some kind of attractor at the larger body size limit. 
Um, more recent work, I think this is a 2010 paper uh, by Felisa Smith et al. Um, and they were looking at maximum body size of different groups. So they looked at carnivores and herbivores. They looked in across different continents and they saw the same pattern where after the asteroid impact at around 66 million years before present, uh, we have this kind of space filling um, dynamic of, of mammalian uh, groups. Okay, and this on the bottom, I'm just giving you a sense of, of this, this large body size space filling uh, end uh, and extreme, extremum, I guess. Uh, here is a modern uh, African elephant. Uh, and these are two of the largest um, mammalian species that have lived uh, on land, again. Uh, Dinothir in, in the Miocene and Andricothir in the Oligocene. So Andricothir is about two and a half times a modern African elephant. So that's pretty big. It's not sauropod size, but it's pretty big. Okay, so today I wanna to really talk about two things. I wanna answer, address two sets of questions. First, what is the influence of starvation recovery on the dynamics of populations? And can it provide insight into processes driving body size evolution? The second theme or the second set of questions is, I want to ask how do individuals balance starvation risk against reproductive investment when resource acquisition is uncertain? And what are the evolutionary consequences? And so you'll see how these two different uh, perspectives are, are really linked uh, together as we go along. Okay, but let's start very simply and something uh, with, with a model that we're all, uh, I'm sure, uh, quite familiar with, or at least have seen before. But the, the lack of Altera consumption model, right? So the, pred the classic predator prey model, uh, except that here I've, I've included, um, uh, you know, saturation of, of, of the resource. Um, so as the resource density declines, so, oh, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, so the, the lack of Altera model really captures um, starvation implicitly, okay? Because as the resource runs out, um, the growth of the cons consumer declines. Uh, because we have uh, this function here, the growth of the consumer is a function of the resource density. So as the resource density becomes lower, uh, the growth of the consumer also is, is hit. Okay, so I'm illustrating this lack of Altera model on the bottom with this cartoon, uh, where the reproductive uh, capacity of the consumer is really tied to the resource density, which I'm just using with these uh, bonsai trees, I guess, supplied by, by Keynote. Um, okay, so that's the, the lack of Altera model. It's Im capturing implicitly this idea of starvation. But could we perhaps think of ways to better capture the starvation process, um, explicitly capturing starvation? And could that give us any insight um, into the di dynamics of, of populations that are really constrained by resource limitation? Uh, and the way that we went about doing this is was to think really carefully about the timescales of, of growth and recovery uh, following a starvation process. And so we started with an ontogenetic uh, growth curve. Um, and so now we're not thinking about the population, but we're thinking about the dynamics uh, in the mass of an individual. So an individual organism is born, so it has some birth mass, and then it grows along this, uh, this, this kind of sigmoid sigmoidal curve until it reaches this asymptotic body mass. Um, now it will never actually, because it's asymptotic, it never actually reaches uh, the asymptotic mass. Um, so we supply a, a cutoff. So say at 95%, the asymptotic mass, that is what we characterize as, uh, as, as an adult size, um, where, where the adult is reproductively active. Um, now, so the adult, its business, it's moving around the landscape looking for food. Uh, if it doesn't find food, um, we have uh, states that the adult uh, can be in. So once the organism hits the adult stage, uh, if it doesn't find food, it starves and it reaches the starve state. Um, so it starves along a different trajectory and it starves to, the, to some point uh, along this ontogenetic growth curve. Now, once it's in a starved state, it can then recover if it finds food again. Uh, so we, and it follows another trajectory uh, outlined here, this recovery trajectory uh, back to its full size. Uh, so really what we have here is a, is a two state consumer model. Uh, the consumer can exist in a full state or a starved state. Uh, now, when it reproduces, it, it takes 
some time for it to reach its full state. And then once it's in its full state, it can cycle back and forth between a starved state and a full state. To determine the time scales of that process of moving back and forth uh, between a starved state and a full state, uh, we considered uh, the amount of body mass that, mammali that mammals typically have uh, as fat. And um, there is a fairly uh, well um, known allometric relationship for the amount of fat mass uh, a mammal has. And again, this is on average. So this is taking the average trend across many different mammalian clades. Um, and I'm showing this, uh, I'm moving my windows around here so I can see it too. But I can see this, or we can see this on the bottom. So, so we have the amount of fat mass illustrated here uh, by the simple allometric equation where there's uh, F naught times M to the gamma. Now gamma in this case, um, as measured from empirical data is 1.19. So it turns out that the amount, fat, the, the amount of fat an organism can hold uh, for mammals, for terrestrial mammals is super linear. Uh, so an organism that's, a, a mammal that's larger can hold um, relatively more fat than you'd expect uh, based on its mass compared to a smaller organism. So the, uh, if we think of this ontogen ontogenetic growth curve in terms of the proportion of the adult mass that anywhere along this curve represents, uh, we can actually uh, identify those proportions as a function of the um, allometric relationships of fat mass and muscle mass. So for example, the proportion of adult mass um, when you lose all of your fat is given by epsilon sub sigma. So it's one minus, this is the proportion of uh, fat mass that an organism is expected to be able to hold given its mass. We can do that for um, muscle and fat mass as well. And so we call this epsilon sub mu. And so this is just one minus this uh, summation between the amount of fat mass and the amount of muscle mass, which has a different allometric scaling um, coefficient and exponent uh, divided by the adult mass of the organism. So here we've identified some, some key points along this ontogenetic growth curve that's that are, that are they're going to be helpful for us in determining both um, what the different states of the, of the organism uh, can be identified as, as well as the time scales uh, required to move from one state or the other. So we are going to define um, the full state as epsilon sub lambda. So this is 95% of the adult mass. We're gonna identify the starved state as epsilon sub sigma, and it's, this is exaggerated here, it's just a cartoon. Um, so epsilon sub sigma is the uh, mass of an adult minus its fat. Uh, so we're assuming, and this is kind of a, you know, an extreme, an extreme assumption, but it serves our ends in, in being relatively simple uh, to calculate. But it's essentially the, the adult mass without the fat mass. So once you run out of fat, you're in a starved state. But if you run out of fat and muscle, uh, because when organisms run out of fat, they begin catabolizing their muscle. Uh, and that usually means, that's usually the death knell for the organism. Uh, but once they burn all of their fat and their muscle, uh, we consider them dead. Uh, so the consumer can exist in the full state, starved state, or, or dead state, okay? Um, so now we have an explicit change in mass that the organism experiences, whether they're full, starved, or uh, dead, and it doesn't really matter what their mass is if they're dead. So now that we have these allometric relationships um, for these different uh, rates um, that characterize how long it takes uh, the time scale of starvation, the time scale of uh, mortality, uh, which is the process of moving from the adult state through the starved state to the dead state. Uh, and again, this is mortality entirely due to starvation. Uh, and and another relationship for uh, the growth of the consumer, the reproductive uh, capacity of the consumer as a function of body mass, uh, we can look at how these rates uh, change as a function of body mass. So here on the body mass of consumers, uh, mammalian consumers, uh, what we've seen terrestrial mammals obtain is outlined in yellow on the, uh, along the bottom of the x-axis here. And this is the rate. Um, so this is the average rate of starvation and how it changes as a function of body size, mortality, recovery, and consumer growth. And I just want to point out a, a couple of fun uh, little features of these rates. Um, and that is these, these strong upper bounds, these asymptotic uh, 
kind of mathematical weird things that happen at very, very large body size. So for example, um, we can solve for the point uh, where an organism is 100% fat. Okay, so given the allometric relationship between the amount of fat a mammalian organism can hold, um, we can solve for the, the point at which it's equal to one, the point at which, uh, at, at what size would the mammal be expected to be if it was 100% fat? In other words, uh, starvation time at this point is infinitely long, and this is why we have this, uh, you know, this this this, this uh, decline here, this this sharp decline. Okay, so if we solve for the point where the organism is 100% fat, uh, we have uh, mass is equal to 8 times 10 to the 8.3 times 10 to the eighth grams, and so this is an organism the size of about 140 African elephants, uh, which would be very large indeed. Um, in other words, it would be about five times the largest uh, blue whale um, ever recorded. So that's, that's large and it's not, it's fun, but it's not uh, biologically meaningful. So asymptotes are by definition unrealistic bounds. And of course, if we're thinking about body size evolution, uh, we really require thinking about uh, within lineage selective driver that's also mechanistic. Uh, and that's what we wanna work towards here. Okay, so we've talked about how these different rates, um, how we identify different states that a consumer could be in. We've thought about how those rates uh, and time scales change with body size. Now, could we put these into a simple Latka Volterra type model, um, but make starvation explicit? So on the top, I have a cartoon that you've already seen that illustrates the, the classic Latka Volterra uh, predator prey model where the uh, where the reproduction of the consumer is tied to the density of resources. Um, below, I've illustrated a little bit of a more complicated model where we have uh, two states for the consumer. The consumer can be full or the consumer can be hungry. Um, this, and it moves between the states by starvation, which is illustrated by this red line, uh, red arrow, and then recovery illustrated by this green arrow. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not sure it was about your talk, but... Uh... <laughs> and, uh, and, and there's also uh, rates determining the uh, maintenance of the biological tissues that's being supported by the full and hungry consumers, and they're a little bit different. And so that's illustrated by these orange arrows. Uh, the blue arrow here is, is the mortality. So, so when you lose all of your fat and all of your uh, muscle, you're kicked out. Um, now, the other assumption that we make in this model, and I think this is a key assumption, is when you're full, you're full. Um, and, and so you're thinking about reproduction. Uh, so reproduction is turned on when the organism is full and reproduction occurs at a constant rate. Um, so reproduction occurs at a constant rate when you're full, but then as the organism transitions to being hungry, reproduction is turned off. So reproduction here is a switch. Um, it doesn't scale um, smoothly with resource density. What does scale smoothly with resource density is the rate of starvation. Okay, so starvation is tied to resource density. As the resources become uh, less dense, starvation picks up. Uh, and so um, in, a, in, a, in a poor resource landscape, there's going to be more hungry individuals. So reproduction is going to be tuned down. Um, whereas in a rich resource uh, landscape, uh, there's going to be more full individuals that are reproducing. And which, which then occur at a, at a constant rate. Okay, so those are the assumptions of the model. Um, I, I already kind of explained everything on this slide, but I just want to show you uh, the non-dimensional version of this explicit starvation model, uh, where we have the dynamics of the full consumer, the dynamics of the hungry consumer, uh, and the dynamics of the, resource, uh, the resources. So we have consumer growth uh, being constant, uh, only occurring for full individuals. Uh, we have starvation, which moves individuals from the full to hungry class. We have recovery, which moves individuals from the hungry to full class. And then we have mortality of those individuals in the hungry class if they continue to starve. Uh, the resources change. They, 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 they have a carrying capacity here normalized to one. Um, and they're consumed to both replenish Hungry consumers that replenish full consumers will consume resource at a particular rate, but also hungry and full consumers uh, consume resources just to maintain their own tissues. 
and that's what's outlined in orange. Okay. Uh, oh, and we're, we we called it the nutritional state structured model. Um, and and again, all of the time scales are based on the, this uh, ontogenetic uh, curve. All right. So um, now that we've uh, discussed the different uh, rates and how they scale allometrically, we've discussed this uh, model that incorporates those uh, various rates that are allometric. Um, we can combine them and we can ask, uh, given allometric starvation recovery rates, can we predict observed uh, mammalian densities? Does this model make any sense? Can we make any prediction uh, to verify that the model is telling us something interesting about the real world? Um, and, and we think that we can. So um, the results of this um, starvation explicit uh, nutritional state structured model uh, map really, really well onto um, known densities of uh, different mammalian systems. Okay, so, so the relationship between the steady state densities of mammalian populations as a function of body mass is known as Damoth's law. I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with it. Uh, we're showing the, the data here as the blue points. Um, and, and this is uh, the steady state. This is uh, actually, I think it's individuals per meter squared, um, but that's, that's fixed in the, in the paper. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we have body mass uh, in grams on the X axis. Uh, the steady states of the nutritional state structured model are shown in green and orange. We have a steady state for the, steady state for the full population and a steady state for uh, the, the hungry component of the population. When you add these two together, that's the total population. And it doesn't look any different than the green line because again, this is uh, log scale. And so, so the orange uh, trajectory here is, is much, much smaller than the green trajectory. But the important thing is that the green trajectory maps really well on top of the data. And so um, we can modify the intercept uh, with, by changing alpha in our model, which is the resource growth rate. Um, and when we set the resource growth rate uh, to something that resembles uh, grass, um, we, we get this intercept here, okay? Um, and of course, that's gonna vary from place to place and area to area. And that, that might explain, um, you know, if we were to subdivide these points into different regions and different um, NPP, uh, you know, or types of areas, then, then we might find some finer structure here. Uh, but really the important take home is that the slope is purely a function of the dynamics and rate equations. Um, and and here's just the equation for the steady state down here. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the, the only source of mortality that we have in this model is starvation. If we were to add an additional external source of mortality, we would modify uh, the steady state uh, trajectories illustrated here. Um, and I'm just going to include, I'm just gonna compare that now. I'm gonna now add in an additional external uh, mortality source and see how that modifies um, F star. What we find is that uh, additional mortality in this model really affects uh, larger species. Um, and you can see that the red line starts veering away from the green line um, at around uh, 10 to the fourth grams. Um, and so it's these larger species that are really impacted by external sources of mortality. And that uh, coincides pretty well with what we understand about natural systems. When we look at large scale extinction events, it's often the large organisms that go extinct. Um, if their steady state population sizes are more sensitive to external sources of mortality, uh, as we see in this kind of, um, you know, cartoon view of the world, uh, then, then that might in part uh, contribute to increased extinction risk. However, there, there, there is a lot of ambiguity um, in the fossil record about whether or not large organisms are more prone to extinction. Uh, and, and part of this is a data problem. Um, there is some evidence that that is the case, that larger organisms have uh, shorter persistence times in the fossil record uh, compared to smaller organisms, but it's, it's really hard to get at um, and, and based on resolution limitations of the fossil record. Now, 
our previous finding was by setting the starvation recovery rate um, to known allometric relationships. Uh, however, we can get additional insight into extinction risk by allowing the starvation rate and the recovery rate to vary. Uh, so here we're not constraining the starvation rate and recovery rate. Uh, we have starvation rate on the x-axis and recovery rate on the y-axis. And, and, and these are a simulation results now. So, so what we're doing is simulating um, the nutritional state model, uh, state structured model over time and uh, applying some uh, perturbations to it, just some simulation induced perturbations and seeing when the system uh, falls below some critical threshold. Um, and we do that many times and we, we turn that in. If it falls below a critical threshold, we deem it extinct. Uh, if it stays above the critical threshold, then we assume that it's, that it's not extinct. And so we can look at the probability of extinction um, as, as a function of starvation rate and recovery rate. And what we find is, is there's two regimes of extinction. So, so blue is um, a low probability of extinction and yellow is a high probability of extinction. And there's really two large extinction regimes. Uh, this is actually a Hoff bifurcation and which we can solve for analytically. And so as you move towards this area, you get uh, you know, cycles and um, cyclic dynamics and that promotes uh, extinction. Over here, the, the steady state of the consumer is being lowered too far. So up here in, in, in this A regime, we have death by oscillations and, and in this B regime, we have death by scarcity. And in the middle, we have this nice little window um, where, where extinction uh, risk is low. And what I'm showing in the white dot, and this is for a 100 gram organism, I'm showing the white dot illustrates the expected value of the uh, starvation rate and recovery rate for an organ, organism of 100 grams. Okay, so it falls within this extinction window, or so this, uh, <laughs> this low extinction risk uh, window. Now, if we move up to 10 to the fourth grams, we find that the window is changing shape a little bit. It's actually getting smaller. Um, one important thing to notice is that uh, the, the, the scales on the axes are changing. Um, and if we move to 10 to the six grams, the window is a lot smaller, but the point is still, the expected value of starvation recovery rate uh, is still within that window. Um, now, now this window doesn't look a whole lot smaller than this one, but because the axes are changing, it's actually about 30 times smaller. Um, so that also, that's another um, way to assess, I suppose, uh, the extinction risk of organisms as they increase in size. The window in which uh, their recovery rates and starvation rates um, operate in a way that shouldn't uh, produce large oscillations in their population sizes is lower. Okay, now, can we say anything about the evolution of large body size? Uh, to do so, we ran a bit, we, we ran an experiment, a competition experiment. Uh, so the competitive advantage of body size among closely related species um, is, is what we wanted to evaluate. We wanted to evaluate if two very closely related species that varied in, a, by, by, in body mass by a small amount, um, we're competing for the same resource, who would win? And we used you know, classic R star theory to determine the winner. Uh, whichever consumer pushed its resource to a lower steady state uh, would be declared the winner. So we imagined uh, a competition, uh, competition between a resident uh, consumer which, that has mass M and a competitor which has mass M prime, which is just modified a little bit. So it's M times one plus chi where chi is the percent change in mass. So the competitor could be a little fatter if chi is greater than uh, zero, or it could be a little leaner if chi is less than zero. And there is a limit because you can only lose so much fat before you dip below that, uh, the amount of fat an organism has, uh, at, at which point it would be assumed to be too starved to continue. So there is a, a lower threshold to how lean an organism can be as a function of its body mass. Um, so we essentially are searching across different masses of the resident and different values of chi, the percent change in mass of its competitor, to see who pushes its uh, resource to a lower steady state and see if we can reconstruct that um, what Alroy was, was uh, seeing in his data back in 1998, this idea of an attractor at a large body mass. 
And this is what we found. So let me walk you through this figure. So on the x-axis, we have the resident body mass. This is the mass of the, the resident consumer. And on the y-axis, we have chi. So above chi, uh, the, the, the fatter competitor wins, uh, for lack of a better term. And below chi, the leaner competitor wins. And we're searching across body mass M of the resident um, and, and the competitor. So what we find is that for lower body masses, the fatter competitor always wins. And that's illustrated by this blue region up here. At very, very, very large body sizes, the leaner competitor wins, okay? So it switches. And the switching point uh, occurs right here. This is what we call M-opt, okay? So um, let's see, I can't. All right. So this switch occurs at M-opt. And if we calculate the value of M-opt, uh, the optimum mass. So this, again, would function as an attractor because it's the larger, uh, the fatter organisms that are winning at lower body size, which means that given all other things being equal, the larger uh, organism would be selected for given this pure uh, resource competition situation. And then at, at larger masses, it would be the smaller that we're selected for. Uh, and the value of that switch point is 1.748 times 10 to the seventh grams. So this is purely a function of the, the simulation that and, and the rates that we put into the model. Now, when we look into the fossil record to see it, the mass of the largest organism, to see how well that maps on um, to this optimum mass, uh, we find that the observed values, the best estimates for the mass of the largest mammalian organisms are for Andricotherium 1.5, times 10 to the seventh grams, and for dinotherium, actually 1.74 times 10 to the seventh grams. So uh, very accurate relative to our um, simulation. So accurate that we checked and double checked to make sure we weren't uh, in some tautological uh, space that, um, and it made us nervous for a while, but, but we weren't. Uh, so we were able with this explicit starvation model to reconstruct uh, the upper bound um, of mammalian body size, uh, thereby, you know, putting a putting an expectation, putting a specific model uh, to Alroy's uh, insight from the North American fossil data. Uh, now we don't have any sign of a of a lower bound, but our you know state structured model is pretty minimal. Uh, we don't have any higher trophic effects. We don't have anything other than starvation. So uh, we might not expect to see too much uh, from this one simple model. Okay, so I want to change gears now um, in the time that I have remaining uh, to the second question. How do individuals balance starvation risk against uh, reproductive investment when resource acquisition is uncertain? What are the evolutionary consequences? Okay. All right, so, so far we have been assuming that only the mean resource density impacts starvation. Uh, but of course we know, as, as I mentioned in the beginning, that resources can be uh, heterogeneous in space. Uh, they can be patchy. And this patchiness depends a lot on you know, resource type. It also depends on the consumer body size and the area over which it forages. Um, and we can capture these relationships by the scaling of the variability of the resource um, and the area over which, is, over which it forages with body size. And I should mention that this, this work was led by the uh, uh, postdoctoral Jedi, uh, Utam Bhat, uh, who's, who's unfortunately no longer in my lab, uh, but he's at UC Santa Cruz. And what I mean by this idea that uh, patchiness scales with body mass of the consumer is, you know, let's consider the savanna landscape. If we look really closely at the savanna mouse, uh, it, sees a, it sees a very different um, type of landscape in terms of its resource patchiness than does an elephant that's moving across this broader plain. Okay, so, so in this case, the savanna mouse sees a very patchily distributed uh, landscape in terms of its resources, whereas the elephant would see a much more homogeneously uh, distributed landscape. And we capture this idea um, that patchiness scales with body size with this parameter zeta. Okay, and this tells us essentially how the coefficient of variation of resources changes with body mass. So when zeta is equal to one, we have a very uniform landscape and that uniformity does not change 
uh, with um, organismal body size. So as the organismal gets larger and larger, uh, the landscapes get gets more and more uniform. Okay, so the coefficient of variation is declining. Uh, and, and sorry, I think I misspoke. The coefficient of variation declines uh, as the organism gets larger. So here, uh, when the organism is small, it sees a more patchy landscape. When it's large, it sees a more uniform landscape. However, when zeta is equal to two, the, the granularity of the landscape is, is preserved as the organism increases in size. So if we consider a, you know, a smaller carnivore that sees a very uh, patchy landscape or perhaps a frugivore that's looking for fruit uh, that's, that's patchily distributed, as we get larger and larger body sizes, that patchiness is maintained, uh, for example, by a large carnivore also searching for patchy food. So the coefficient of variation uh, when zeta is equal to two is, is preserved as a over consumer body sizes. We simulated a um, uh, consumer uh, model on top of these uh, on, on top of these impli spatially implicit um, areas. Okay, so so this whole model is based on this uh, energetic um, model of consumption, where a consumer has some amount of reserves, and as it finds food, it adds to the reserves. So it's foraging in a landscape, and when it adds when it finds food, its energetic stores increase. And then of course they decrease due to metabolic uh, costs. So the organism spends some amount of energy, uh, which we have as B, it's replenished as they find food. And uh, importantly, when, it, when the organism's energetic state hits a certain point, it invests a large amount of energy into reproduction. And that energy then is distributed across L um, offspring and its litter. Okay, so it's a relatively simple uh, uh, model um, where the landscape and resources themselves are um, implicit. Uh, and what we're tracking is the energetic state of a given consumer. So, so it actually replicates a lot of the dynamics that we had in the nutritional state structured model, except that also includes uh, this, um, the ability for the landscape to be uh, heterogeneous, right? It's not, we're not constrained to this mean field type of uh, perspective. So this is really taking uh, an individual perspective of a system and then expanding it to populations. So we can and do treat this as an, op as an unconstrained optimization problem and explore different life history strategies over resource richness, variability, and patchiness. Um, but we can also assume these life history traits that I illustrated before, how much energy the organism spends in different processes, how it's distributed across litters of different sizes. Um, we, we can assume all of those parameters uh, follow expectations from allometric relationships for terrestrial mammals, and then numerically solve for population steady states. Okay, and when we do that, um, we can find how uh, steady state dynamics of the consumer population changes as a function of resource patchiness. Um, and now this is just kind of a cartoon example to illustrate one of our findings. And that is that um, when the system is not patchy, um, we, we find a single steady state. Uh, when it is patchy or as it becomes more patchy, uh, we have the appearance of an Ali effect. Okay, and the Ali effect is represented by this orange line here where as we get close to zero, the change in population size over time is, is, is negative. Um, and then positive above this critical threshold. I think everyone's probably familiar with the Lee effects here. Um, and we can uh, derive a measure of stability of the system by looking at the, the, the single eigenvalue of the population. Okay, where the eigenvalue is telling us, um, uh, giving us the steepness of this uh, trajectory at the steady state uh, n star, and the steeper the trajectory at the steady state, uh, the, the smaller the time scale of the perturbations of the system, uh, which, which implies a, a, a fitter system. So we're taking this now as a measure of fitness for the population. When we um, measure this, this fitness metric, okay, again, the, the leading eigenvalue and where the, we're, we're a larger value implies a smaller uh, time scale of perturbations, so a more stable system, we can then map that across uh, body mass of the consumer and how clustered the resource is, which is given by zeta. And so again, one 
is a very uniform landscape, resource landscape, and two is a very patchy landscape. And we can see that um, lambda, or the log of lambda in this case, um, which is more stable in the blue side, so the larger values are more stable and, and red is less stable, um, changes a lot as a function of body mass and resource uh, clustering. Um, and this gives us a, 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 essentially a fitness landscape that, or we can interpret this as a fitness landscape where um, more stable regions, organisms should be moving uh, towards larger body size, right? And, but, it, but it depends on the types of resource and how clustered their resources is uh, in terms of their trajectories towards these larger body size. Um, and there's a lot to kind of think about with, with a figure like this or a prediction like this, but one of the things that we want to do is try to leverage this prediction against something major in the fossil record where resource distributions really shifted. One of these big shifts occur, um, if, are really obvious if we look at systems from the Eocene and then the late Miocene. Uh, if you look at these two illustrations of what the Eocene looked like or likely looked like and what the late Miocene likely looked like, one of the big differences is grass. Uh, grass evolved around 10 million years ago and Eocene uh, did not have grasslands. There weren't any such thing as grasslands. Uh, grasslands really exploded in the late Miocene. So we might assume then that um, before the explosion of grasslands, food, especially for smaller mammals, uh, and mammals happened to be smaller before the explosion of grasslands, uh, tended to be uh, more heterogeneously distributed, whereas in the late Miocene they were more uniformly distributed. So can this perspective uh, that we've uh, built with this really simple model uh, provide any insight into the ecological forces driving the transition uh, to grassland resources? Uh, we see evidence of the explosion of grasslands beginning at around 15, but not really picking up until about 10 million years before present. Um, this is from a, a paper by uh, Caroline Stromberg. Um, and or, uh, yellow here is the presence of uh, open grass dominated uh, uh, vegetation in the fossil record. So this is really where uh, grasslands come on the scene. Now with this grassland explosion, this grassland transition, uh, we see the evolution in mammalian diet. Um, so we see many different mammalian clades begin consuming lots of grass resources, whereas before they weren't. Uh, these are different mammalian clades um, illustrated here. And what's on the y-axis is Delta C13. Uh, so that is a measure of where they're getting their energy. Uh, low values of Delta C13 mean they're getting their energy from browse resources and high values of Delta C13 mean they're getting their energy from grass resources because grasses, tropical grasses use a different photosynthetic mechanism and that um, has a different isotopic signature than, than uh, non-grass resources. And on the x-axis we have age in million years before present. So what you see for equids, bovids, hippos, um, gomphotheres uh, and really all taxa, if we average them together, is this move towards grassland resources. It is what we see as things transition from C3 to C4 as grasses become more prevalent. This is in Turkana Basin in Africa. We see the same shift in North America, um, and it's a general shift uh, in mammalian communities where grasses become available. So we can uh, make the assumption that uh, grasses are evenly distributed or in pure grasslands, grasses are evenly distributed. And so if you have a Delta C13 value associated with uh, grasses, uh, you're getting your resources from a more even landscape. Whereas if you have a lower Delta C13 value uh, that is, uh, you know, that, that, that is the value of browse resources, that you'd be getting your resources from a patchier environment. So this is an assumption that we're making uh, when we look at the fossil data. Um, so let's assume then that a, heter a homogeneous uh, landscape of grass has a zeta equal to one, uh, where it's just purely even, uh, which, which may be unrealistic, but it's, it's gonna be close to one. Whereas a landscape that's patchier is going to have a higher zeta value. What is the zeta value of a patchier landscape? Let's take a savanna woodland uh, that's very, very heterogeneous. Um, we can go and grab pictures of these savanna woodlands uh, from Google Earth. Uh, we can turn the vegetation uh, into black pixels and, and the, 
the non-vegetation or the, the non-browse uh, vegetation into white pixels. And we can actually measure using a box counting algorithm uh, the average zeta of, of the system. And it turns out if we do this a lot for a lot of different um, uh, landscapes, the average zeta of these, these woodland resources is 1.71. So now we have this correlation between high delta C13 values of grasslands where zeta should be close to one and a low delta C13 value um, of browsers uh, with an with a average zeta of 1.71. We can then um, map uh, extinct organisms into this fitness landscape, where again, we have zeta on the x-axis, and this is also uh, corresponding to our kind of interpolation of delta C13 values. So we're using the delta C13 values of consumers to map them into this zeta space. And then of course, they're reconstructed body size. And what we see um, if we plot a bunch of different organisms, so we have sewids, equids, rhinos, let's just focus on the smaller ones at first, across different time periods, so the darker values are longer ago at around 10 million years before present, and the wider values are towards the present, we see a movement, a trajectory that follows the predicted fitness landscape. Um, as they consume more even foods with the evolution of grasslands, they're increasing in body size uh, following uh, what we would predict based on this uh, fitness landscape. Now things get a little more uh, messy as we get larger and larger and larger. And this is effectively because larger organisms have a lot more fat. Uh, again, fat uh, mass is super linear with respect to body size. And so they can kind of eat what they want. And so the relationships somewhat fall apart up here um, as would be predicted because they have the uh, their, their, their bodies can uh, take advantage of many different types of resources, whether they're evenly distributed or unevenly distributed. Rhinos are kind of in the middle. They follow the trend, except for um, black rhinos, uh, which, which tend to be um, choosier uh, consumers. They, they tend to browse for foods, whereas the, the white rhinos tend to graze. Um, so we find when we look at these uh, extinct species, they tend to follow this uh, fitness landscape as predicted from our very simple model uh, where we incorporate the energetic demands of consumers um, and the, the patchiness of foods. Okay, so uh, thank you. I know that was uh, a lot to fit into an hour um, and I appreciate uh, being able to, to, to visit Italy uh, kind of um, over the last few days and, and thanks very much. Yes, I hope you enjoy the food. Uh, so thanks a lot, uh, Justin, for the very nice lecture. So we have time for a few questions. So please, if you want to ask any, uh, uh, you now know how to do it. Uh, we use the raise and uh, tool or type it in the chat. Well, actually, I, I have one uh, in the uh, about the first part. Um, so uh, in the when you have the model with the starvation and uh, um, and grazing. So in some sense, it seems to me intuitive that there is a separation of time scale. Perhaps I'm interpreting wrongly the equation, but that there is a separation of time scales between the starvation versus uh, grazing and uh, the population dynamics. Uh, and I mean, what typically happens when you do this separation of time scale is that uh, uh, what emerges like a nonlinear functional response. Um, so I was wondering if. Uh, there. Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. I yeah, um, you're you're absolutely right. Um, there there there's a large difference in the time scales, um, and we haven't really investigated that possibility um, in, in terms of how that might be interpreted. So you're saying effectively that you can uh, capture that process, because the time scale of starvation and recovery is so short, uh, you can capture that process with a, with a nonlinear functional response embedded within the pure uh, population equations without uh, the individual dynamics. Yeah, so. I mean, for instance, if you have like, uh, let's say a predator who is, is in two states like uh, handling and, uh, and um, uh, foraging, what you get is a uh, only type one functional response, only type two functional response. Right. Um, right. If you do the separation of times, so I was wondering if the, the, there is a map thing there. 
Yeah, that, that's a really interesting question. That would be interesting to, to poke around with. I, I honestly haven't even thought about it. <laughs> so um, but, but that, would, that would be interesting. And that would simplify uh, things a lot. Um, I think, you know, what would be really helpful, and I think it's helpful thinking about it in both ways, right? Because um, the kind of complete picture with all of the time skills allows you to kind of think real hard about the time skills of the different processes, but then how they might condense into a, a single functional response um, may allow you to kind of travel to a simpler system with those known time scales. Um, yeah, that would be interesting. We should look into it. Yep. So there is a, a question from Washington. Yeah, hi, thanks very much. Those were really uh, great lectures and I thought that was really interesting stuff. Um, I just have a quick question. So you apply your model in the context of mammals and you give this very specific prediction for the upper bound on mammal body size, which matches remarkably with what you get out of known data. Um, it, what is the difference if you apply this to say reptiles or dinosaurs? I mean, what would, what would be different in the model and have you tried trying to make a prediction there as well? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's um, one thing we really want to do. Um, the only thing that, because because the model is written generally uh, without assuming any um, particular exponent or coefficients, et cetera, we applied those known for mammals um, because they were readily available. And I tend to think a lot about mammalian systems. My, my, my dream to, is to, you know, kind of in, incorporate a dinosaur perspective. Um, mm -hmm. There are um, some good estimates of, and, and so basically, it wouldn't really take much except a change in the coefficients. And I don't even think, yeah, the exponents wouldn't change, but the coefficients would change because uh, for example, dinosaurs, some were certainly endothermic, um, some were certainly ectothermic and a lot looked like they were mesothermic. They were falling in between kind of like great white sharks um, are, are mesotherms or tuna. And so, so it's a metabolic kind of, distinction. Basically, the meta me metabolic, basically metabolic processes will determine different coefficients, which would give you different exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it re it's really just changing the, the the coefficients of the system. And then maybe the other thing that would need to be thought about is um, whether you know just the the productivity of the landscape and uh, what types of landscapes different. If again, dinosaurs thinking about dinosaurs were were foraging within um, and. I think all of those would be really fun kind of thought experiments to run to see, you know, even if um, we could, because these are analytical, um, you know, equation or, you know, these are equations, um, we can see like changing what coefficients starts pushing that upper bound up and what coefficients start pushing that upper bound down. Um, because of course, sauropods push the upper bound up um, and, you know, the rhapsids and, and other smaller uh, kind of reptile like mammals uh, were had had a lower bound. They, they, they didn't get as big. So it would be a really interesting kind of thought process to, to work through kind of the flexibility of, of this space. Cool, thanks a lot. I got one other quick question actually, which is you alluded to the higher extinction rate for larger mass uh, organisms. So I guess I'd always kind of assumed that had to do with longer lifespans and smaller absolute abundances. Um, but it sounds like you're saying there's more to it than that potentially, is that correct? Yeah, you know, I think um, it's, I think the the classic thought and, and I don't think it's wrong necessarily is that you know, especially the gestation times of larger mammals uh, makes it really difficult to recover from any big population uh, problem. Um, I, I think large mammals, and it, yeah, it kind of falls into this generalist specialist thing that I was, I, I mentioned in one of the earlier talks. Um, it, it's like large mammals, they, they have more resilience within their lifetime. So smaller perturbations to the system within their lifetime. You know, if you, if I, if I don't eat for a week, um, I'll be unhappy, but I'll survive. But if a mouse doesn't eat for a day or two, it's, it's gone. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's more flexibility with those smaller perturbations, but then kind of less flexibility with those large perturbations. And I think a lot of it has to do with uh, gestation time um, and just how to re you know, how quickly it takes to rebuild those populations. Cool. Well, anyway, thanks very much for the great lectures. Yeah, thank you.
Great. So uh, we have time for one uh, uh, quick question from Monday. Monday. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Pravastan, uh, uh, for that wonderful lecture. Please, I, I want to look uh, uh, deeply into this uh, grassland interaction with the reproductive pattern of mammals. Uh, does this mean that um, the turn down in the population of mammals can be fast disappearing due to climate change and anthropogenic factors? Because uh, you you uh, talked about that uh, um, um, that uh, the the grassland contributes to how fast they grow uh, into a, a big and bigger sizes. So I'm looking at situation whereby uh, and and also affects their reproduction. So I'm looking at a, a situation whereby if, if 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 grassland is fast disappearing due to the impact of climate change and other factors, it means we are going to have a, a lesser population of these mammals. Can that apply? Yeah, I mean, thank I, you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think there's a lot of mammalian diversity tied to grass resources, um, and I would certainly expect as you lose those grass resources, that would contribute to to extinctions. Um, I guess I would be um, careful about. Uh, you know, the models that I was, were talk was talking about today, these are very, these are kind of like average models applied to like the average mammal. Um, so I would be really careful about making a specific um, prediction with respect to any specific species um, based on these dynamics, because they're, they're based on average trends. Um, and each system has idiosyncrasies and a lot more that goes into determining an organism's niche space, et cetera, um, that would contribute differently to the extinction dynamics. Um, I think, you know, taken across many systems, and this is where the model, these models are more appropriate, where we're comparing, where we're comparing average trends across many systems. Um, I, I think uh, that that would absolutely be true. That is, you know, you have organisms that are tied to grasslands as you take those away or and, and under really short amounts of time, um, then, then we'll witness uh, extinctions of those organisms. I think, you know, one of the important things is in the past, these transitions uh, from more forested or wooded landscapes to grasslands, they were relatively slow. Um, you know, our grassland indicators in the paleo record, they're over, you know, millions of years um, or, or at the least hundreds of thousands of years. So there was time for evolutionary response um, there was time for selection uh, to modify what organisms were doing, which we see when we look at the isotopes, they, they switch to grassland resources. Um, we're making modifications to the landscapes on timescales much shorter than that. Uh, and so I, I would expect that um, just the differences in timescales of disturbance versus, you know, the evolutionary process is going to uh, increase extinctions um, relative to, you know, what you might expect during a slow transition. Great. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Terrific. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Justin, for the lectures and answering all the questions. Uh, we are now taking a, a six minute break and we'll be back at 6 15 p.m. Italian time with uh, uh, Justin again and other panelists for the last session of this week. Thank you very much to everyone. Uh,